My name is Hakeem Fassler and I'm an LGBT human rights advocate from Jamaica. Formerly I worked with JFLAG and JFLAG is the premier organization that focuses on LGBT issues in Jamaica. So that includes uh, advocacy at the local, international and government levels. The current human rights situation regarding LGBT Jamaicans, it, there's a bit of a mixed kind of feeling right now. So there has be, it indeed been a change because before what you used to have was major human rights violations and we're talking about physical assault, we're talking about people suffering from their houses being burnt so they're displaced and made homeless, we're talking about people being attacked at random, groups of people being attacked on their way home from school or work or wherever it is that they go. But no, it's not so much uh, of that frequency of violations. It's more uh, verbal assaults and you do have the occasional incidents of people being attacked. Very recently, I think three months ago or so, you had a pastor being killed and it was because of his sexual orientation. So there's still some of that, but it's not as prevalent as it was before. Jamaica is at a place now where openly we've had the first documented gay pride march but i'm not there to hear some of the feedback and how it went you know to see if people i've only seen videos on facebook because i'm not there so i'm not sure if there was sort of a homophobic tension going on but i think that in and of itself the fact that jamaica was able to celebrate their first gay pride march i think that in itself would signify progress However, because I've not been there for over a year or so, I can only speak to the things that I've been hearing and the videos that I've been seeing coming out of Jamaica from other advocates or, or from members of the LGBT community. JFLAG is the only organization in Jamaica that stands at the forefront and works with LGBT issues. There are other organizations that work in LGBT with and LGBT human rights but it's from a different perspective it's more from a medical perspective because one of the things in Jamaica is we do have a high HIV and also syphilis rate of infection among uh, gay men in particular so a lot of the work that comes to LGBT people is through those organizations who want to work with gay men from a medical perspective but when you look at advocacy and activism and all the other forms of ways you can support somebody's human rights which do not which are not only limited to the medical perspective but the nutritional support the psychological support the family reintegration because that's also very important to feel like you belong and then to get your family to understand some of the struggles you're going through as a LGBT person J flag would be responsible for that uh, so my last case I think was on somebody who was actually here because I did a lot of documenting of human rights violations also I was responsible for the parent support group which I just mentioned and that was an opportunity as I said before for parents to come and to listen and understand some of the struggles their child would be facing just simply because they're gay you know and it's interesting because what I've realized is that if you have a friend or a family member and they've never known that you're gay, you've never said it to them, they've never had any sort of um, inclination that you, you're gay, once they find out that you're gay, automatically you become a different person. It's, it's as if you've changed in their lives, in their eyes, you, you're nobody to them. So there's also a bit of that that's in the family as well, you know, we live in a society, it's culture, and sometimes it's very difficult for parents to accept the fact that you're gay. So the parent support um, intervention, the parent support group that we had was basically so to control that or to, to help to assist those parents sorry in understanding what some of those struggles were and also I think another thing that I worked on before I came here was to remove some because you have big open fields in Jamaica that are not being populated by anybody especially in Kingston so what you do have you have those homeless youth 
who go there to find shelter, to find refuge, because seeing that it's, it doesn't belong to anybody, it's sort of, you know, a safe haven for them. But eventually the community finds out what's going on and then they come in with their sticks and they come in with their knives and, and stuff. And so it's important that, you know, we at JFLAG stay on call. And so I was part of the mission to rescue some of those guys who were out there and needed to, you know, be transported from that da dangerous situation to a safer place. There have been several stories, but I think one that was particularly, I think it was particularly moving because um, you didn't expect, you know, sometimes you see people and uh, you they talk to you every now and then and they say, you know, I'm going through stuff, but you don't really understand how deep it is. You know, and I think there was this guy, I, I always knew him and he came to me, he came by the office, he said, you know, he wanted me to, to document some of the stuff that he's been through because he wanted to leave Jamaica, you know, and he didn't, he didn't know how to, to, to go about it. He didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do, of course. I, I'd have to refer him, but he wanted his story documented also just in case anything happens to him and he doesn't get to leave Jamaica. And I remember him just sharing how at 14 he was molested, you know, and, and it wasn't one of those situations where somebody wanted to to, they were going through their own homosexual journey and they were confused and they wanted to experiment. It wasn't one of those situations. It was a situation where it was deliberate. It was particularly deliberate. They knew he was gay. And so in their mind, I don't know how, but in their mind, they wanted to, to prove to him that being gay was a bad thing. So they thought and they interpreted it as, you know, sexually abusing this young man, raping this young man. And I mean, it's not even considered rape in our constitution, but that's what it is. Raping this young man, violating this young man, you know, traumatizing this young man. It's a very traumatic story, you know. So I think that's one of those that really stuck with me and said, well, you know, um, continue to do the work you're doing because people need you. And it's not because you are so important why people need you is just that you actually took a step and made a decision to fight for these people. And I think anybody who stands up and is willing to fight for people, I mean, you're already a hero in my eyes, you know? So I think those are some of the things that allow me to continue doing the work I'm doing when I remember those stories, yes. The Constitution doesn't define or include in its definition the penetration of of the anus by penis. Based on the constitution, it has to be the penetration of the vagina by the penis. Or there's a little gray area where it speaks about other objects, but the vagina is really at the center of it, and the vagina is what has to be penetrated. So it does not include uh, two males, you know. And to go even further where the constitution is concerned, if based on the definition by the constitution if a man has sex with another man is considered buggery. It's a very old English way of doing things. It would be considered buggery and both persons will be culpable. Even if you're a minor, you will be culpable, culpable because what it says is that you're engaging in this illegal act and they, the constitution of Jamaica doesn't care that it wasn't your choice. Constitution doesn't care that you didn't ask to be raped, as I would describe it. You didn't ask to be violated. You didn't ask somebody to, to strip away your right from you. So the Constitution doesn't protect that. I think one of the things, and that's a very beautiful question because I think changing legislation is important and that's a very good thing to do because it protects people. But also what protects people is a very broad term known as support. And I use that term a lot because I think it, it, it fits into anything you, you want it to fit in because support comes in so many ways. And I think the government should do more in terms of ads about there was a situation in Jamaica where this new curriculum was, was, was developed to, 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 
to teach people about you know sexuality and sexual orientation and the, the diversity that is on the sexuality continuum and the government and the schools and everybody didn't want to accept it this was done by human rights advocates of course and they didn't want to accept it because it asked a simple question to the general populace imagine if you were gay in an all straight all heterosexual world how would you feel and I think people weren't comfortable being exposed to that sort of um, confrontation. People weren't honest about how they would feel because the reality is that you wouldn't want that. Nobody would want to feel that way of being gay in an all straight world when you know that you live in a society that condemns, that hurts and that debases people you don't want to live in that society and so i think the government should do more in terms of embracing these kinds of questions that human rights activists want to ask embracing these kinds of questions doing more in terms of ads when you have films coming there you have heterosexual films being celebrated but you can't celebrate the the the, the, the fashion show or some other social cultural thing that LGBT organizations are doing or LGBT people are doing or how LGBT people are viewed statements aren't being coming aren't coming out the the, the the prime minister the former prime minister went on international tv to say that no homosexual could be in his cabinet so when you have that sort of rhetoric what it does is it reinforces whatever the the society thinks it reinforces what the people who are hungry for blood because they think that homosexuality is not normal it reinforces what they think and then it it just adds fuel to the fire and it perpetuates that sort of um, negative heteronormative not to say that anything is wrong with being heterosexual there's nothing nothing wrong there's also nothing wrong with being homosexual and I think that is what the society needs to hear what the government needs to do by promoting that promoting more safe spaces for LGBT people if it means getting the police involved to show support somebody has to take a stand LGBT human rights activists and other human rights activists are also taking a stand but it's important that members of the government who swore an oath to protect people to protect the people of their nation should also take a radical step it's a combination of things, but I think at the top is religion because Jamaica has the most churches per square mile than anywhere else in the world. So we have tons of churches. So it's definitely fueled by religion, but it's also fueled by a thing that we call dancehall culture. And dancehall culture suggests that a real man is macho. He's macho and he, he has several women he has a woman every other day, multiple times for the day. That is how the culture is seen. And so when you identify as homosexual, it means that you're having sex with a man, whether you identify or not. But when you have sex with a man, then it, you're seen as less than a man. And also there's the belief or the notion that homosexuality comes from white people. And because we're black and because we're former slaves, we should not embrace that and so anybody who embraces that is weak to the white man and so there's this uh, there's this anger and just uh, this violence that comes up from that and also from ignorance because people really don't understand and also people don't care but i don't play, place a lot of emphasis on ignorance because i think at the core of it people know right from wrong people know right from wrong and, 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 and people ought to know what it means simply hurting somebody else is wrong especially based on the, the, the especially solely based on the fact that they don't agree with you or they like somebody who looks like them you know so I don't blame the ignorance I just blame the dancer culture and I also blame uh, the fact that the government has also not been doing enough for its people. The government has failed its people. And um, there's also the part about it that's the dance or culture 
that we seek to embrace so much or we still want to maintain which is also good when you look at it from an aspect of music and tourism and everything and that is is good but when you look at the fact that people have to suffer because of it then it really isn't a good thing yeah there is support from international organizations there's a lot of support going into primarily hiv and stis uh, because as i said before you know there's a high hiv infection rate among uh, gay men so there's a lot of support coming from that perspective there's also support coming in terms of creating uh, medicational support medication not support medicational support in terms of creating medication for, in terms of procuring medication for persons who are infected with HIV or other STIs. There's also support in terms of, uh, from USA and other organizations that allow us uh, allow us, uh, allow human rights activists, sorry, to do interventions with the LGBT community. But you can do so much because the activity might take the shape of a poetry night or it might take the shape of having something that's in an enclosed space because you're worried about your safety so a lot of these activities aren't necessarily public and, and even some of those activities that are public they're held at hotels or stuff where you know at the basis of it you have like primary security because the hotel staff the hotel security has a responsibility to protect you so there's that bare minimum of security and also you try to take the necessary steps to protect yourself to ensure your safety and security so there's international support but it's not that bold if you will because there's some things that you can do out in the open as long as your homosexuality isn't necessarily illegal in Jamaica. The act of having sex with a man is illegal, illegal in Jamaica. But the people don't make the distinction. The people don't care. They don't make, they don't make that distinction. And so they just, once they find out oh, you're gay, they automatically assume that you're engaging in sex with a man and they don't care that you're trying to understand yourself or go through a journey. And you know, they don't care about that. So they listen to what the government has to say. They listen to what their neighbor has to say. They listen to what the church has to say. You know, they listen to their own personal beliefs that have been passed on from generations that gays are bad, lesbians are bad. Despite the fact that lesbians are a bit more accepted in our culture, sometimes because of the male fantasy, that's one of the reasons they're more accepted in our country. But once you're gay, a gay man, then it's a little bit more difficult for you. It's entirely more difficult for you. And it's also difficult f for your parents. And, and some of that, some of their beliefs, because even if there's a situation where your parents accept you, if the community doesn't accept you, then you have to leave. And your parents, you might just be displaced because they, they've lived there for their entire lives. You know how they felt about gay people, but you're their child, so they understand that. But this is their home and this is their this is where they've settled and their beliefs so you have to go so a lot of it is a combination of several different factors but at the top i'd have to say the church of course religion plays a big part in it i think one of the things is that uh i think international organizations have pointed it out to them have said it but they've not come with force and i think there are many different reasons and diplomatic relations and stuff as to why another country would necessarily come with force to say you have to do this or you must to do this i think law i'm not very big on law and i think law is a bit more delicate and and and, and, and than uh than that but what i do know is that based on the laws that, that are there, I've dedicated my life to challenging those laws. But, so there are organizations, organizations that say, Jamaica, you need to do better. The government of Jamaica needs to do something. But I don't think there's anybody really holding them accountable. And especially the people are not holding the government accountable. I am optimistic, especially because you do have uh, other 
human rights activists who don't want to give up. I certainly don't want to give up. My goal is to go back to Jamaica and actually contribute, and actually to contribute to the Jamaican community while I'm here. Because I think as a human rights activist, uh, it's it's difficult for you to see something happening, to see people being oppressed and not feel the need to get involved. I don't know why. I certainly didn't choose to be a human rights activist. I wanted to be a lawyer, funny enough. But I think when you see, when you identify with a group of people, when you see injustice, injustice is injustice and it can be nothing else but injustice and you feel the need to step up. I think it's important to step up and to say something. So I'm optimistic because there's still human rights activists who are dedicated to the work, but it's extremely difficult, especially when you're dealing with a society or the majority of persons in the society that are, that are saying, no, you'll never be accepted, you'll never be welcomed, you'll never ever have a place in our culture, in our society. So it's really difficult, but I, I'm optimistic. It may take a long time, who knows? Who knows because radical movements act sometimes they take a long time to take effect and um, I might not be around when it happens but at the end of the day I'm just a piece in the puzzle it's not about me so as long as I've contributed to the fight it will be okay a trans woman from Jamaica uh, she had She's also dedicated to activist, acti activism and advocacy as well. So she thought it was important to do some work with refugees also based on her own struggles. And I agreed because I also experienced some stuff in the asylum centers. And I think it's important to do some work with, with refugees, but to also broaden the scope, not just refugees, but migrants, because there are different migrants who've had different experiences while coming to the Netherlands. So some uh, have been afforded the opportunity to stay, but some have had to return or migrate to different places. So we have people who have different journeys, people who've left countries where you know, they were just completely exiled. So they're coming with different issues and also experience issues while being here, a difficult asylum procedure. People not believing you based on a form or a criteria that they think, you know, is important to judge whether you stay in the country or not. So you have different struggles going through. So I think it's very important to, to do some work with some migra with migrants. So we've been working, as I said, she's a trans woman, and we've been working together for a number of years back in Jamaica, you know, and um, so that's how we met her when we came here and she was sharing the idea with me because she knows I'm very good at planning and organizing stuff and she knows I'm, I'm very good with, with organizing activities and, and, and developing protocols and stuff. So she reached out to me and she said it would be very good. But I decided to, to, to be part of the organization because I think it's a real issue and it's important that we do work with migrants and listen to what migrants have to say. You know, whether they reside in the Netherlands or not, I think anybody who comes to the Netherlands, you know, especially if it is that they're being targeted in their own country simply because of their sexual orientation or their gender identity, I think it's important to ensure that these people are heard and to ensure that they, even those migrants who are not uh, in the Netherlands simply based on the fact that they're being discriminated against by their sexual orientation just by virtue of perhaps war, I think it's important to have some of these needs met. The Netherlands might not be able to meet all of the needs, but I think some of the primary needs need to be met. So that's why I decided to be part of the organization. But from personal experience, mm -hmm. I think as it relates to medical support for migrants, I think there needs to be a different approach. I think it's important, the fact that it does exist, because as a migrant, if you have, for example, traumatic um, experiences or any sort of medical issues, I think the Netherlands does offer support, but I think I have a very big criticism, especially when it comes to psychological support, because while you do, you are allowed to meet with a psychologist, 
it pretty much comes down to you need to take pills you need to constantly take medication and yes we understand what you're going through because you come from a traumatic country or you've had traumatic experiences but the conversation while you are in these refugee camps or in these um, asylum se reception centers it's not the same feeling as when you're granted uh, asylum status when you're recognized as a refugee it's different the not much effort is made to ensure that you're okay and that you're coping before you enter into a new society and I think it's very it's very interesting because when you leave from a country to resettle in another one there's a period of adjustment and I think the healthcare system as it relates to psychological support isn't very supportive of that and then there's a other problem of when you are actually granted refugee status and you move into a new city a new municipality the government immediately wants you to work and contributing to the con to the country and to your community is very important but it doesn't really understand that you are still struggling with some of those traumatic um, experiences some of those suicidal ideation and some of those things that will in the long run hinder you from being a wholesome individual and positively contributing to the society that you live in. I think there are several things that can be done to improve this situation. Uh, one of the things is, as I mentioned before, a different outlook, a different um, perspective on how we view uh, traumatic experiences and tra psychological support of migrants. I think one of the things that could be done is to include migrants in the conversations. If it is that you want to do some work with a particular group, I think it's important to uh, uh, include the group. I, I think it's, uh, it's difficult to say that you want to provide services to a group when you don't know the services that they need. So they need a place at the table, you need to listen to them. You you need to have focus group discussions, you need to allow migrants to also critique the system. It's a system where okay what you say goes and okay you will listen to some recommendations but no you should also allow them to have a seat at the table what it is what is it that migrants need what is it that you're providing is it acceptable is it good is it working not because you say it's working how do we measure these are for example i realize that there's not so much uh of support as it relates to migrants who come from places like syria one of the things i think it's important is that you need to keep people to keep people in programs for example it could be an english speaking program for example it could be uh, basketball competitions that really support and bring happiness in their lives and help them to forget about some of those traumatic experiences rather than just offering medication you know get them in skills building programs programs that will bring some amount of certification for example in housekeeping or in other kind of kinds of avenues so if they do return to their country at least they're in a better eco um, academic situation than they were in before they got here it's uh, Jessica Burton a trans woman from Jamaica and two other persons from Jamaica uh, it was not set out to be that way a group of Jamaicans but when the idea was pitched there was also a young man from um, from Gambia but he's Currently experiencing issues with trying to get his is uh, to be recognized as a refugee in the Netherlands, so it's a little bit difficult for him to to be on the board and to be planning and making it to the meetings and everything. But for now, it's just for Jamaicans.